All right. All right. So, hi, everyone. Welcome to Park City Museum's first live Zoom lecture. We are glad you are here with us tonight. A few housekeeping things to go over in case you haven't done this before. We are asking everyone to be on mute so the speakers will not hear any background noise. I can put you on mute in case you have problems doing it yourself. If you have a question, please use the chat room box, which should be on the bottom of your screen, to type in your question, which we will try to answer during the presentation or shortly afterwards. If you have a technical issue or question, you could use the same box or call me. Um, please do not use the raise your hand option if you have it on your computer as it becomes distracting to everyone. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speakers tonight. Sandy Brumley has a BA in economics from Northwestern University and an MBA in marketing and finance from Columbia University Graduate School of Business. His principal qualifications for the Thomas Kearns project is a love for reading newspapers and a, a desire to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Michael Kearns and his wife Miriam are award-winning magazine and newspaper publishers in New York and Utah. They have one son, Judge Thomas Kearns. Michael has been a journalist for over 40 years, is a native Utah, and spent 20 years in New York as an advertising executive. He was an owner of the Salt Lake City, uh, I'm sorry, the Salt Lake Tribune, and is the great grandson of U.S. Senator Thomas Kearns. A Los Angeles native and longtime New York City resident, Josh and his family were relocated to Park City in 2011, where most recently he served as a director of business and corporate development, reporting to the CEO at FJM. He has been involved in several Park City community initiatives, including serving a two-year stint on the board of Weilman School. He is an avid cyclist, a fairly okay skier, and a proud father of his son, Max, and daughter, Margot, both of whom recently relocated to Santa Barbara, California. And so at this point, I am going to turn it over to Sandy. Um, for those of you who have questions for me, please just put it in the chat room and um, I'm gonna go dark so I'm not blocking Sandy or uh, Josh or um, Michael's view. So, um, but I will be here. So if you have anything for me, just put it in the chat room and we'll, we'll talk about it that way. Thanks so much and enjoy the lecture. Sandy? Yes, thank you very much, Diane. Um, just before we start, uh, I'm just going to say I'm Sandy. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking now. Uh, Josh, maybe you want to pipe up so that they know which face is yours? Um, Josh. <laughs> there we go. And then uh, the other person who will be talking is Michael. Michael? Hello. Nice to be here. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, I want to thank Diane for, uh, for setting this uh, session up for me. Um, uh, and, and also want to thank the Park City Museum community for kind of inviting me into your fold. Uh, Diane kind of first hired me as a, as a docent and then promoted me to writing uh, scripts for the graveyard tour. Uh, and that kind of led directly to, to this presentation. I started researching uh, the various characters in Park City mining history and one popped right to the top. This fellow Tom Kearns is just a fascinating guy. Uh, he's colorful. Uh, it's a rags to riches story that's that's kind of well known. Um, he, he had public life, you know, where he achieved great success first with the Silver King mine. Uh, that was a springboard for him into the formation of a railroad. Uh, he got together with several others to form the Los Angeles, San Pedro, and Salt Lake Railroad. Uh, and that then in turn kind of catapulted him to uh, the role of U.S. Senator. Now that stuff is all kind of well known. Um, what I did discover was there's uh, some interesting Wild West back, background tales to Tom that, that had to shape his history. And so really this conversation today is about how did Tom become the man he became. Uh, I'm going to, oops, make sure my screen is set up right here. I'm going to follow this timeline uh, with one exception. I'm not going to walk you through the timeline right now, except to, to kind of say that we start with birth and we end with death, and then we tell the stories in between. Uh, the reason for the timeline is just that uh, as I was doing this research, uh, there was an event that happened uh, sort of right at the pinnacle of Tom's uh, early years uh, in 1890 uh, that led me to do some initial research and discover some stuff that happened back in O'Neill. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to try to stick to the timeline, and, and where I where I jump off, I'll, I'll try to let you know so that's not too confusing. So uh, Tom's story really begins. I mean, he's he's born 
1862, uh, his family moves from Canada to uh, O'Neill, Nebraska in 1870. And, you know, in that era, Tom is, is a kid. Uh, you know, he strikes out on his own at the young age of 17 uh, when he heads off to the Black Hills. Uh, if we look at, uh, you know, his birthday, we can kind of calculate that he spent about 17 months ranging between uh, the upper left-hand corner of that map there in, in Lead, South Dakota, and the lower right-hand corner in Nebraska City. Uh, there are various newspaper articles that kind of place him in those locations. And during this time period, he's, you know, he's really a young man. He's, he's looking to figure out how, how, how does he become who he will become. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, widely reported that from the beginning he was, he was interested to make money. So it's not surprising that he should have gone off to a mining town uh, like Lead. Uh, but, you know, he worked as a teamster, a cattle assessor, and briefly as, as a miner. Uh, for the home state mine, and, and indeed, this is the first time that, that he worked for George Hearst. Uh, later on at the, at the Ontario was the second time he went into Hearst's employ. Uh, Michael, are there any uh, sort of interesting tidbits from this era that you would add? Um, yeah, I would say that uh, I think you said it before. He, you know, he's kind of rolling in there about three years after... Uh, while well, Bill Hickok was murdered in Deadwood. And, uh, uh, you know, it's still kind of wild and woolly territory. It's the Wild West out there in Deadwood, but he's, you know, he's got to cross it to 200 mile area from Pierre to Lead, where the homestake was. And still, um, still Sioux territory, even though it was slowly uh, dissipating the, 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 that culture and, and uh, Sitting Bull, who uh, was not a chief, he was a medicine man, but he had to run up to Canada to escape. And um, so you got this kid who's the teamster running across from here to, to lead. You know, Tom Kearns, I guess you could say this was one of his first failures. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't make a stake in the home stake. So well, he managed to fail upward. So that's that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now is where I'm going to dart to a strange place in the timeline. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, an event that happened in 1890. Uh, it's really just as Tom was beginning to be successful. And the reason I, I bring it up now is is what happened was a fellow named Alex Langdon appeared on the scene. Uh, he uh, is hassling Tom because of Tom's background in O'Neill. He's heard something about that background. There's also a letter uh, that turns up at that time uh, that was sent over to the sheriff of O'Neill, and somehow it found its way back into Tom's hands. Seems likely to me, there's no record that says this, but it seems likely to me Tom was friendly with the people in the town of O'Neill. And hey, the letter came in and the sheriff got it and he sent it to Tom. Uh, but the letter makes a and, you know, a, a, a challenging accusation, right? It's, it, it's asking the question, you know, was Tom involved in uh, either a murder or some felony back in, uh, in O'Neill? That led me to, you know, to go back into the newspapers uh, and, and discover some events that, that he said it? in the historic books. Yes, Josh. It, j just to clarify, that letter uh, presumably came from Langton, right, to O'Neill? Well, it's, it's actually not clear, right? Uh, the, the letter, as they argued about it at the time, uh, uh, you know, Tom had the letter, you know, he kind of confronted Langton about it, said, hey, did you write this? Why did you write it? Uh, Langton actually denied writing it. Uh, and there was quite, quite a bit of back and forth, but I, I don't want to get too deep into that. Okay. I'll let you up. Just kind of a trigger that led me to dig back and find out this stuff. So now we're back in 1880. Uh, on the timeline, and uh, what happened was a sequence of events. Uh, Tom, you know, has been up in uh, in the Black Hills, but he returns to O'Neill for reasons that you know are not clear from what's available. Uh, but soon after he returns, he's arrested for illegal assembly uh, with a group of friends, and uh, a member of that team, of that group of friends that that are uh, hassling this farmer named B.S. Gillespie. Uh, the leader of the team is shot and killed. Now, Gillespie is acquitted, 
So it's definitely, you know, sort of proven that, uh, that Gillespie was not the troublemaker here. Uh, you know, what does that say about Tom? Well, well who knows? There's not, there's not, there's not a, a great deal of detail around that, uh, that, that specific charge. Uh, in the meantime, Tom's uh, half-brother Barney is sheriff of the town, and he's helping Tom kind of cover up for uh, what's happened here. Uh, but in the middle of all of that, uh, you know, in, in March of 1880, uh, Barney is shot and killed. Uh, and so at that time, Tom is 18 year old, years old, Barney is 25. So these are fairly young people. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, a, uh, a posse is formed and heads out and, and basically captures Barney's killer, a fellow named Cowboy Billy. Uh, and, but uh, for the most part, um, what happens soon thereafter is uh, after Barney is shot, uh, his deputy, who is also shot in the event, uh, decides to hire Tom as his own deputy. So uh, uh, the fellow uh, ascends to the, to the throne, if you will, of, of sheriff, names Tom as his deputy. Um, subsequent to that then, uh, the town clerk loses the paperwork related to the illegal, illegal assembly arrest. Uh, and basically Tom is let go. Uh, he's also at that point in time in June released his deputy. Uh, later that year, Barney's killer is acquitted. And so, you know, that's, that's a fairly intense sequence of events, right? It has to, you know, really affect, uh, you know, an 18 year old who's just trying to figure out, well, who do I want to be? Um, but there are some, definitely some interesting stories. And Michael, you've got a great one from, from the family lore. Uh, maybe you can share that. Um, yeah, kind of interesting. Bernard, like a lot of tough sheriffs out in that area, um, he carried a Colt 45 um, that probably rarely, if ever, shot anybody with it, but he used the gun barrel upside some people's heads uh, when they got out of, when they got out of line. Uh, certainly the cowboys, their money was wanted in that town. And uh, I think, um, you know, people just wanted to leave them alone as they uh, got into town, just let them spin and get the heck out of there. But uh, after Barney was shot, uh, I was looking at my census papers here. Uh, Barney may have been a little older than that, like closer to 30. Um, but when he was shot, there are some articles which talk about a posse running after uh, Billy Reed, who's the cowboy that shot him. Um, and when he was shot, uh, family lore and some letters we have uh, show that Tom was handed uh, Bernard's gun and taken to a barn where Billy Reed was there and it was kind of assumed, you know, shoot him if you want to. And he, I guess that wasn't, his, that wasn't his way. It wasn't his character. So uh, not long after that, he left for Tombstone. Kind of like the fire into the fire, the uh, frying pan, but. Sandy and, and Michael, very quickly question from the, um, we had was, was Barney's actual killer acquitted or was it someone who had been accused of killing Barney? Yes, his, his killer, as, as uh, Michael mentions, was, was a fellow that they refer to as Cowboy Billy Reed. Uh, there was no question that, that he was the guy that killed him. There were multiple witnesses. Uh, the acquittal uh, is, is indistinct, as reported in the newspaper, um, just that he was acquitted. It, it, as often happened in those days, uh, juries would look at a sequence of events, see two guys got into a fight that ended with one of, of them being killed, and they would often let someone off, you know, for, for reasons of self-defense. And Thank so you. Uh, but it's, it's not clearly stated in any of the newspapers why he was acquitted, but, but it's known that it was Billy Reed, he was acquitted, he was let go. Lots of colorful newspaper coverage around what happened to him after that, a report that he visited the town of O'Neill in disguise. But, uh, uh, you know, I did spend some time trying to look through the records to figure out where he might have gone. 
and, and it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, William Reed or Bill Reed, there are a lot of them out there. It's, it, you know, he disappeared. Surprising is the fact that he got off and actually had a lawyer. I can't remember where the lawyer was from, like Omaha or Lincoln or something, but he got a lawyer, uh, probably paid by the Cowboy Association because uh, they had a lot of power selling cattle and money. So it's, that is a fascinating part of it, what really had the details. So then equally fascinating to me, and Michael, I know you and I have kicked this back and forth quite a bit. Uh, Tom leaves O'Neill and goes to Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's not precise as to when he might have left, probably sometime between June when he lost the, uh, the deputy position and maybe October when the verdict came in. Uh, but, you know, if indeed he arrived in uh, Tombstone by October 26th, he, he would have been there for the gunfight at the OK Corral. And for, uh, for folks who may or may not have heard of that, uh, you know, that was an event where uh, the Earp brothers, uh, Virgil, Morgan, and Wyatt, were in a shootout with uh, numerous cowboys. Uh, Bill and Morgan were wounded in that initial event. Uh, their, their friend Doc Holliday was grazed. Uh, and a couple of the cowboys were killed. Now, the, uh, the, the violence did not end at that point. Uh, later that year, uh, Virgil was wounded and, and maimed by a, a group of cowboys. Uh, in March of 1882, uh, Morgan was murdered in retribution. And then sort of from March 20 to April is the famous Wyatt Earp Vendetta ride, where he chases these cowboys out into the desert and tries to catch them. So uh, as far as I can see in the written record, yeah. you know, uh, there's no connection to Tom. I'm, I'm just watching this now. Any of the newspapers at this point? No, she's out somewhere. You know, he's there. And, you know, you got to wonder, here's a 19, now 20, you know, becoming 20-year-old kid. Uh, his brother's killed by cowboys. He goes to this town, and cowboys are still killing the lawmen. That really has to shape your outlook, right? And so, I don't know, Michael, are there any, are there any things that you might want to, you know, chime in that, uh, that you know happened when he was in Tombstone? Well, he, uh, yeah, he, I think he wanted to find, I think he wanted to stake to a mine. He wasn't looking for gunplay. Uh, like a lot of his friends. So uh, I, I think he actually learned a lot about uh, mining in oh. Tombstone. Uh, when a, a man named Shefflin discovered the silver mines there in uh, Tombstone, uh, they played out fairly quick. And then they had two fires after that, which almost put an end to the town. But uh, you can imagine Tom Kearns being around uh, these lawyers and engineers. And the lawyers and engineers were the ones really making the money at that time because the silver was playing out and there were tons of lawsuits uh, built around this time. So uh, he, I'm sure he couldn't help but learn something about the law, apex rights, uh, uh, mining engineers, you know, he, he made friends pretty easy. So uh, uh, I think that he learned a lot. You know, people talk about him taking night school classes and such, and I'm sure he did to, to learn something about mining was in Park City, but I think it started in uh, Tombstone, maybe at the Homestake mine as, as, as well. So uh, anyway, as, as Michael talks, uh, says, you know, the, uh, the mines begin to play out. Tom is restless. He's, he's still looking to make his fortune, and he decides to move on. Uh, and, uh, you know, where he chooses to go uh, is, is first uh, to the north, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, he, uh, he's moving around. Uh, some stories report that he's working for the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, uh, building up what they called in those days a traveling stake. Basically, you could work for a period of time and, and then get credits to, to take the railroad other places. Uh, he heads off to Pocatello, Idaho, uh, but makes a U-turn when he hears about developments in Park City. Uh, and uh, and he, he arrives in Park City in June of 1883. Uh, he soon finds employment uh, at the Ontario Mine, which is uh, the second time that he works for George Hearst. 
uh, and he meets at that point, uh, you know, the gentleman who will become his lifelong partner in all of his business adventures, mining, railroads, and even newspapers later in life, uh, David Keith. Uh, the interesting thing, though, to me, again, with this sort of Wild West history that he's living through is uh, just after Tom arrives in Park City, um, a prospector named Matt Brennan is shot in the back by a former partner that's known as Black Jack Murphy. Uh, and in the space of just a few days, uh, the townspeople of Park City uh, capture Murphy and they lynch him. They hang him from a telegraph pole downtown. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of suspected at that time that, uh, you know, that there might be a lynching. Uh, and since there was no jailhouse in Park City at the time, you know, they hauled uh, Matt Brennan off to, or excuse me, Black Jack Murphy off to Colville, uh, which is a nearby town. Uh, and uh, what happened then was, though, on, on the night of uh, September 1st, uh, the, uh, a group of masked men, you know, hijacked the train to Colville, went, picked Murphy up, and, and brought him back to town. Uh, so, again, it's interesting that, you know, you've got this uh, sort of Wild West violence happening. Tom was here for it. There's nothing in the written record to suggest that he was part of it, but you know, yet again, uh, the Wild West continues to 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 surround him, and and really all of the the folks in Park City. Uh, so I'm going to move ahead into you know the phase when Tom becomes really successful, right? His first six years here, he's working as a mucker in the Ontario mine, uh, and uh, but he's always looking, right? And he's studying and he's learning. Uh, he's building a relationship with David Keith um, that, that ultimately blossoms into his mining success. And what we have here on this drawing at the upper left is a, is a map of the mining claims uh, that are up Woodside Gulch in uh, Park City. Uh, and where Tom started out was actually working under contract on the Woods, Woodside mine uh, for someone who was leasing that property uh, from the actual owner, uh, uh, E.P. Murphy, uh, sorry, E.P. Ferry, who is uh, one of the founding fathers of the town. And as Tom is working the woodside, he figures out that uh, the vein that they're working there branches into the Mayflower. Uh, he quickly does some deals uh, to purchase the Mayflower property. Uh, and he does that in concert with, uh, with five other folks, uh, David Keith, uh, John Judge, who's a famous miner in the town already, uh, Albion Emery, who is uh, formerly the postmaster, and he's now an accountant for uh, the Ontario mine at that point, uh, and a fellow named uh, 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 Windsor Rice, who is another close affiliate of the so-called Michigan Bunch, the guys that sort of founded the town. Uh, and so uh, they continue to, to, uh, to mine and to pull ore out. Uh, they're making you know, significant profits by selling the ore. Uh, and as they're working the Mayflower, they realize uh, that then the claims extend into another uh, section of the mountain called the Silver King Group. Uh, and they, uh, uh, they cut a deal uh, to, uh, to license the property from the Silver King Group and to, and to bring the owners of the Silver King you know, into the deal. Uh, and and it, that's really the basis of the Silver King mine. Um, you know, ultimately it became one of the, the most productive mines in the city. Uh, this chart on the right, you know, shows that, uh, you know, in the years that it was mined, it had by far and away uh, the leading tonnage of ore mined. Uh, also, uh, you know, one of the leading um, producers of silver. Uh, the pictures here on the lower left are just what, what was ultimately built, this, uh, on the, this is over here is where the, uh, the mine itself is, and this is the mill. Uh, and then on, on the right here is, is the terminus for the aerial tram that, uh, that, that Tom basically invented and built. Um, but what's, uh, what's interesting about timing here is that from, from 1889 to 1890 is when the deal is being put together to create um, Silver King. And uh, there's actually a deal signed on September 13th of 1890 uh, to create that deal. Uh, Michael, I know you know a lot about this, and you and I could probably go on for hours about how, how the dealings happened, but maybe you can share a little color about, uh, about how, how all of these uh, miners worked you know, with the contiguous claims. 
it was it was kind of a funny group uh uh, but they all had their part in this play, and and uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Tom was uh, building a tunnel uh, in the Woodside, uh, working for a gosh, uh, sorry, senior moment. The Wilmot Brothers or Wilmer Brothers, who leased the mine, so he was working for them. Saw this vein going over to the Mayflower, and uh, talked to. Dave Keith about it, he trusted him. And uh, he, they, they all got together. You know, Emery was a bookkeeper, so he had that. Uh, Ivers was a blacksmith, which was really a valuable person to have on your team. Um, Rice was a secretary at, of the anchor mine at one time. And then of course, the, starting into the Woodside. And John Judge was invaluable because he, he was well known as a guy that could get things done. He built the, uh, there's a tunnel from the anchor as well that John Judge built. He was an independent contractor. And Kearns was a, basically an independent contractor. He worked at the Ontario. Uh, Dave Keith gave his first job. Did we go into how they met? And uh, uh, there was a, a, a church social that uh, since Tom was new there, they let him judge the most popular foreman. And it came down to Dave Keith and John Judge. And uh, despite voting for Judge, Keith gave him a job <laughs> as a mucker. <laughs> and uh, he became a shift foreman and uh, then was able to go off on his own. You know, I, I don't know how these guys did it. They, you know, working, working uh, eight or 10 hours and then uh, going off and looking for their own thing as well on the hills. So anyway, uh, as Tom is, is, ab is about to sign this deal with, uh, with the owners of the Silver King, that's actually when Alex Langton came on the scene. Uh, there's, uh, there's a bit of a history before uh, the actual murder of Alex Langdon. Uh, you know, there's some interaction between Tom and a fist fight between Tom and Alex Langdon. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the bone of contention is this accusation that, that something went down, uh, you know, back in O'Neill. And with, you know, with that Silver King deal on the table, you can well imagine, hey, you know, Tom doesn't want, you know, that, that dark story coming out. Uh, that's probably why he's asking Alex to keep quiet about it. Uh, but uh, what happens then is a protege of Tom's, a fellow named Woodson Moss, uh, is sitting in a bar on September 10, uh, and Langdon comes in and basically kind of picks a fight with him. Uh, he, he calls, uh, uh, Langdon calls Moss a Kearns lick spittle, and as you can well imagine, men's fighting words, right? <laughs> uh, Moss's reply is, you're a goddamn son of a bitch. Uh, to which Langton replies by punching Moss in the nose. Uh, Moss then shoots Langton uh, in the gut, and uh, he dies a couple of days later. Uh, but, uh, you, know, can, you know, just put yourself in Tom's shoes, right? You're, you're just about to sign this big deal with the Silver King to, to make yourself the wealthy man you're going to become, and this event happens. Uh, so, uh, ultimately... Uh, uh, Moss is tried. Uh, the town is very, very supportive of Moss during the trial. Uh, uh, Ed Ferry was like the mayor. Uh, R.C. Chambers was the uh, uh, the manager of the Ontario mine. Uh, John Judge, who was you know a famous miner and engineer, uh, they all went down to testify on Moss's behalf. Uh, there's a great colorful scene where uh, Sheriff John Weber, who's the sheriff at the time, you know, describes being in the bar as this happened. Uh, and uh, his testimony reads like it's straight out of a Louis L'Amour novel, right? He's, he's lighting a cigar as, as, uh, as Langton enters the bar. Uh, and then he, you know, he really, you know, kind of describes what happens. Um, okay. the, der the derivation of that letter uh, may have started with a Cornishman named uh, Tommy Williams. Tommy Williams owned a hay farm down uh, toward Snyder Sawmill, and it was Tom's first job, and he got in there and, uh, you know, needed money, didn't have any money, obviously, when he first came in, 
and uh, Tommy Williams, like a lot of people, took a liking to Tom and, and uh, took him into the Catholic Church where they're having a, this is where the popularity contest was with Judge and, and uh, Keith. And they used to call friends or cousin, uh, cousin Jacks, the Welshman did. So perhaps uh, I've seen it written that uh, people thought Tom was hiding something, that he was pretending to be a cousin of Tommy Williams. It was just a common, common thing that uh, they would call him a cousin Jack. And in fact, that's why they had him uh, uh, judge the popularity contest. And Langton uh, and Moss had been in town for a while. Langton about three maybe four years, and Moss was an engineer at the Ontario for nine years. So that's kind of part of the tragedy in that is that, you know, they had friends, people liked them, and then this happened. So anyway, the third big thing that happened to Tom, uh, you know, in the same week of September was uh, he marries the beautiful uh, Jenny Judge. Uh, so Jenny Judge is is the niece of John Judge. Uh, so clearly the you know the business connection between Tom and John has uh, has personal connections as well. Uh, but you, you gotta wonder, right? Uh, you know, uh, on these uh, these two events happening back to back like that, boom, boom. What what did they talk about on their wedding night, right? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway, fast forward ten years. I want to get the rest of the story out here. Uh, Tom is contacted, uh, and, and several others are contacted by uh, William Clark, who's a miner from, uh, from Montana. And what Clark wants to do is, is build a railroad from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. Uh, that'll basically help him move his ore and goods you know, into the LA area. Um, an August group of people gather to build this railroad. David Keith, not surprising, he's uh, Tom's uh, business partner. Uh, W.S. McCormick is also involved. McCormick, by that point, is a private banker uh, who's on the board of uh, the Silver King. Uh, and then, you know, to really uh, uh, conclude the deal, you, you have to have one of the apostles. So a fellow named Reed Smoot, uh, who uh, is also part of the initial board that, that forms the railroad. Um, the, uh, you know, dealings with uh, the Mormon Church at that time become very important, in particular because the terminus of the railroad is in downtown Salt Lake. A lot of the land is owned by Mormons or indeed by the church. Uh, and, and this actually uh, puts Tom in good stead uh, with a fellow named Lorenzo Snow, uh, who was the fifth president of the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, and, uh, and it gives him a springboard for... Uh, for what happens to him later in life. Uh, the railroad itself is, you know, the last of the big major railroads built, uh, you know, in the United States. Uh, it was capitalized at $250 million, which was a vast amount in those days. Uh, and as you can see in that map at the right, I know it's a little hard to read, uh, it's basically following the route that Route 15 takes to get down to Los Angeles, right? So it, it's opened up a big artery between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. Uh, and is, uh, you know, in its early years, a, a highly profitable railroad. Other family stories, uh, Michael, that might come? come? Well, I, I do want to say it, it, uh, it was the last important railroad built in the United States um, to get fruit and vegetables, which were a big deal back then. Uh, they came up from Los Angeles up the Feather River route through, you know, San Francisco, Sacramento, and then across, it took 48 hours. Um, this railroad shortened that by half. And that was a big deal uh, at that time. Uh, uh, Clark was a very colorful senator. He basically paid off his entire legislature to get, legislature to get uh, elected. Um, uh, they actually, people like uh, editors Goodwin and publisher of the Tribune at the time, uh, Lannan, Lanahan, Lanahan, uh, they spread rumors that he was in cahoots with the Mormon church, which he probably was. He was, he got along with them fine, especially Snow, who was very smart. Snow knew how important it was um, later on 
to help Kearns get elected, and I'll get that when you're ready. But uh, he actually, they never bought the Saltaire route. They actually built around that route, but somehow they, uh, uh, they went after him. You know, when you have that much money and you're starting to get into politics, uh, people come after you sometimes. So anyway, uh, the, uh, the relationship built with the Mormon church puts him in a position to become a senator. Uh, this is the time in the United States when senators are elected by the legislature. Uh, and uh, basically the legislature at that time, then as now, votes along Republican lines. Uh, and so Tom's arrangement you know, with the church to be their candidate is really key to him getting elected. Um, he, uh, he takes a seat that was uh, actually left open when the state was formed. Uh, so he serves a total of four years, uh, basically rounding out the, the six-year term. Um, he, uh, you know, he introduces Smoot. Smoot later arrives as the other senator. Uh, and so Tom introduces Smoot to uh, the D.C. audience. Uh, during his time as a freshman senator, uh, he had a, a variety of adventures, uh, including uh, he was able to receive an audience with Pope Leo the uh, Thirteenth. He introduced President McKinley when McKinley passed through Ogden Station. Uh, he secretly bought uh, initially the, the Salt Lake Tribune. Uh, eventually, it became well known that, that he owned the, the Tribune with uh, with David Keith. Uh, he uh, he worked with Roosevelt uh, when Roosevelt took over from McKinley, um, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, his main uh, mission was to try to secure bimetallism or the silver question, basically to create a, uh, a an economic relationship between the price of gold and silver. Uh, he did not succeed in doing that. Uh, and then uh, as he neared the end of his term, it, it became pretty clear that he'd lost the support of the Mormon church. Uh, which caused him to uh, to uh, be upset. Uh, and before he left, uh, he actually read a lengthy speech um, that, that kind of comes down to three main points. He read this into the congressional record. Uh, he claimed that the, the Mormon religion is uh, a church monarchy, uh, that polygamy was still being widely practiced in the state of Utah, and that that, that immorality continued. Uh, and he tried to, he spent a lot of time drawing a connection between the, the tithing that's, that's done to the Mormon church uh, and in a sense that he had that, that, that they were trying to, to create a kingdom out here in the state of Utah. Uh, so uh, he spent you know, a good eight or ten years kind of railing on this topic. He, he formed another political party. Uh, but really, as, as that was uh, continuing, then his sort of his last major business adventure happened. Um, he's, he's sued by a, another mine on the mountain uh, that's called Silver King Consolidated. Uh, and uh, here I'm going to veer again off the, uh, the timeline a little bit because uh, there's an interesting character that, that's really driving this process. Uh, there's a person named Salon Spiro. Uh, ultimately, he builds a thing called the Spiro Tunnel, which is one of the seven major tunnels here in Park City. Uh, but but uh, I'm going to go all the way back to 1886 to just give a little background on Salon and, and talk about what a colorful character he was. Um, he shows up in Park City uh, in about 1886. Uh, his job is actually working for uh, MS Anschlein, which is one of the major department stores in Park City and sort of a quasi-company store for the, the Ontario mine. Uh, apparently, he's an annoying character because uh, there are newspaper reports as, as soon as 1888 about him getting beat up by R.W. Davis, who at that time was running the Marsac Mill, uh, and D.C. McLaughlin, who's uh, one of the later uh, partners for uh, Keith and Kearns in the Silver, Mon Silver King Mine. Um, in 1883, that's this little freak of nature article on the, uh, on the slide. Um, he tries to sell uh, a the water from a spring that sprung up in the basement of the department store as having medicinal properties. So he's, he's a little bit of a huckster, uh, but it's not until about 1901 that he actually buys the Bogan Group and starts his mining venture. Um, ultimately, he uh, spends a lot of time 
uh, recruiting capital back east. He's from uh, Cincinnati, uh, and he uh, he finally generates uh, sufficient capital to buy up a group of mines that he then names uh, Silver King Consolidated. Uh, that's an interesting tack for him to take because, of course, Tom and and David Ke uh, Keith are already famous for running the Silver King, so he's he's probably trying to lever that brand a little bit. Um, Ultimately, the two uh, companies come into conflict because uh, uh, Spiro owns uh, some land that's contiguous to the Silver King. He leases it to the Silver King. Uh, and uh, what, what happens is miners being miners, they dig the ore, they take it out. Uh, there's supposed to be an accounting arrangement between the two mines that, that pays uh, King Khan, as it's called, uh, a... Um, uh, you know, a portion of the proceeds from the mining, uh, but but ultimately uh, uh, they they discover that that that's that there's an accounting irregularity. King Khan sues the Silver King. Uh, there's a lengthy court battle, but ultimately um, uh, there's a payout of about nine hundred and five thousand dollars from the Silver King to King Khan. Uh, this is a big cash windfall uh, for uh, for King Khan. And what Spiro does is basically plow that money into digging uh, the the, uh, the Spiro tunnel. Um, he uh, he digs it with the idea that he's going to be as successful in in discovering silver along the way, like like various other tunnels here uh, in Park City. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the 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 sad and interesting story is that uh, he basically plows all his money into that tunnel. Um, and uh, it, it bankrupts him. Now, we're off the timeline here a little bit again at the other end of the Spiro story uh, because uh, he's bankrupt at, by about 1924. As we're going to find out in a minute, uh, Tom dies in 1918. Uh, but what's, uh, what's sort of funny and ironic about this story is that uh, he sells out to uh, the Silver King, uh, and the Silver King continues digging that Spiro tunnel in another 60 feet up the way. Uh, they hit one of the biggest uh, silver loads uh, on the mountain. And so in spite of this, this sort of battle between the two companies, you know, ultimately it's the Silver King that, uh, uh, that, that wins the proceeds from, from that tunnel. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the last colorful event that happens to, uh, to Tom. Uh, you know, he dies in, in 1918. Uh, his death is, is probably as interesting a story as, as the rest of, of his tale. Uh, he's walking home uh, by Pioneer Square, right downtown in Salt Lake City, in front of the, the statue of Brigham Young, you see there. Uh, and he's, uh, he's struck by a Model T car. As the newspaper reports at the time, it was Model T number 17,773, driven by a guy named E. Watts. Uh, and so Tom is injured. Uh, his leg, in particular, uh, is injured uh, pretty pretty badly, uh, and eight days later, he dies at his home uh, of a stroke related to to the blood clot. Now, at the time of the accident, uh, Newt, uh, Tom claimed that uh, that he tried to avoid being struck by the driver, uh, but was unsuccessful. Um, there's really no additional reporting that suggests that that was investigated. Um, and uh, and that's that's his sad demise. And I know Michael, you've got some additional background on on Watts that that you can share. Well, I'm still looking at him, except he was a young guy, uh, uh, part of the Mormon ward that's around there and stuff. Uh, he uh, he hit the senator and broke his leg. That's what a lot of people think that. Uh, brought about a stroke. At the same time, the Spanish flu was going on <laughs> around that area. Uh, uh, Dave Keith had just died over at the, ho the old Hotel Utah and then uh, Tom not long after. But they actually took him down to his office, which was about three blocks down, instead of taking him home, which was about the same distance up there. But yeah, uh, they did get him home and luckily he had his entire family uh, around him when he died, but he did mention that he thought the car veered towards him, and when he tried to get out of the way, it veered towards him again, which uh, 
could lead to another story. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's ironic to me, you know, at the, at the dawn of the industrial age, Tom has been a big driver in, uh, in, in bringing the industrial age to Park City, uh, building, you know, major factories to process or building railroads. Uh, and, you know, he's killed really in one of the, uh, the first traffic accidents, kind of a sad irony. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's as much as I have on Tom today. Um, I, you know, Josh, I know you've been gathering questions from folks. Uh, what, what have we got? Uh, what yeah, so I, what I, I want to encourage folks, uh, if, uh, if they'd uh, like to ask questions, please uh, send them via chat uh, on the chat at the bottom of the screen. And, um, um, one question I have for you, uh, Sandy and Michael, uh, to kick things off is, what do you make of the fact that Moss was acquitted so quickly and it seems so brazen that you know, it was obvious, it seems from those newspaper articles you posted, that he committed the murder and yet in, within 30 minutes he's found not guilty. What, 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 what do you make of that? So yeah, let me have a crack at that and, and Michael, I'm sure you'll want to jump in as well. Um, you know, he had the full support of the town uh, and uh, it's, it's almost as if, and, and you know, they were put in the, in the newspapers at the time, not only did it take the jury only 30 minutes to come back, uh, when they come back, all the parkites are sitting there in the courtroom and they're cheering. It's like, yay, Woodson got off. So, uh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, it, you know, it's almost like the, the town was rooting for, for Woodson as, as Tom's protege to get off. I think uh, Langton was a miner. Moss was an engineer, which was an important job at the Ontario number two there. And uh, like I said before, he had been there nine years. Langton had been there maybe three or a little bit more. So um, he could have even had some bad feelings for Kearns uh, because he was a mine and Kearns was a shift boss uh, during his tenure there. And like I said, Langton, maybe he was looking for something. Uh, it comes back to the Tommy Williams part where uh, Langdon, you know, maybe thought he was hiding under an assumed name. That's part of the story there. But uh, it's kind of a tragic story. Like I said, I think Park City is a family town, but I think murder or shooting someone, killing someone was a big thing, maybe more than now, nowadays around our... And uh, Moss committed suicide in the Cullen Hotel there. He actually laid out a nice suit on the other bed before he had taken, I, I, Sandy was a lot of morphine or something. Yep. And uh, it's really, I mean, it's really, when you think about it, it's kind of tragic because I'm sure they both had friends and, and such, but uh, Moss erroneously reported in one or the other paper was that Moss was a widower or that he was separated from his wife. So obviously suffering from depression as well as that. Got it. So, so we have, uh, th thanks guys, we have a, a one statement, one question here. Um, uh, Michael Malley points out that Governor Herbert's security detail currently says that Mr. Kearns is still seen wandering <laughs> the halls of the mansion from time to time, which is, uh, seems very uh, uh, prescient and interesting. <laughs> I've, I've never heard of a haunting at the mansion. Uh, uh, what, what Josh is alluding to is that, uh, that Tom's mansion uh, in downtown Salt Lake City uh, became the governor's mansion, and apparently, uh, apparently, Tom still roams the halls there, like maybe looking for a good meal. <laughs> well, what, what, what I've heard that. I don't know how true it is. You know, a, a lot of family members died in that house, so uh, could have been anyone. <laughs> Another question that came up was, um, what was Kearns worth at the end? Uh, what, what, uh, he went from what, what? What were his riches from the rags? Uh, well, by the time he died. That's kind of a fun factoid. Uh, uh, he, it said he was, uh, you know, uh, the government came after Jenny Judge for taxes and such, and, and they settled on that he was uh, worth 2.5 million. Uh, family lore has always said, but it was probably twice that, but they didn't want to pay taxes on it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, you look at the house, my God, uh, uh, I should send you a picture of the, uh, a, a little documentary I did on the Kearns Mansion. I'll, I'll send that if anybody wants to see it, but uh, it's on Vimeo as well. But 
uh, you know, the family, they had three safes, a wine safe, a silver safe, and a cash safe. And they're all full length safes. So there was a lot of money there. He had, uh, Kearns had just started getting involved with uh, uranium mines down in, a lot of people don't know that. He was one of the first people to be, to mine uranium down in Southern Utah. So uh, there, was a, there was a lot of money out there and, and uh, everybody in finance knows it's all about cash flow and there's a lot of cash coming in through uh, finishing up through Silver King and the Salt Lake Tribune, Salt Lake Telegram. Uh, he was a large bondholder in the San, uh, San Pedro, Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad. And there were a number, of, he had a, a 2000 acre ranch in Sonoma, which I wish we had today. Uh, he also had <laughs> another uh, thousand acre ranch in Elko, Nevada called, uh, called the, Cur it was the PX Ranch. Um, so there was a lot going on there, but, but they were very careful. Uh, John Fitzpatrick, who um, ended up being the publisher of the Tribune and the secretary to, Mr., uh, to Senator Kearns, uh, he was pretty savvy with finances. So another, another, thanks, Mike. Another question. What happened to Jenny? Did she continue to live in the Kearns mansion? And, and, a, and a related question is how long, how much longer did the family live in the mansion? Well, my father, uh, Jenny lived there until 1937 uh, when she gave it to the state as the governor's mansion to be used as governor's residence. Uh, my father and his two sisters, uh, youngest being Colleen Kearns, who Colleen Kearns Steiner, well-known Salt Lake family, and uh, Catherine Jane Stevens, they all grew up there in the 20s. And uh, my dad lived there until uh, he was 16, and he went off, off to Bellarmine. Um, and then he uh, went to Georgetown and then uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps, uh, World War II. Uh, uh, a distant cousin, uh, Jack Gallivan, was in and out of the house. He was a ward of Jenny Judge and his two sisters. Uh, she was a very generous woman. But my family, my father, Thomas F. Kern, my grandfather, Thomas F. Kearns, and my dad, Thomas F. Kearns, and his two sisters, and uh, his, his wife, Catherine Whitney, who, by the way, I was going to mention that Thomas Kearns, he didn't hate Mormons. He just didn't like the Mormon hierarchy. His favorite and beloved daughter-in-law is Mormon royalty, who uh, is related to um, uh, Horace Kimball Whitney. And his father was Newell K. Whitney, who was Joseph Smith's number one. Horace was Brigham Young's number one. In fact, uh, uh, the senator and Keith bought the Tribune, uh, but the Mormon side of my family, uh, we started the Deseret News. <laughs> so it's kind of a kind of an interesting piece there. But I also wanted to mention that uh, they bought the Salt Lake Tribune secretly with the help of a man named Perry Heath. Perry Heath was kind of the PR guy for the Republican Party back in St. Louis when um, McKinley, vis-a-vis -vis Mark Hanna, was running for president. Uh, Mark Hanna really handled his life back then. But Perry Heath uh, was the publisher of the Tribune, and he kept everything quiet until they couldn't keep it quiet anymore. Got it. Go, going back in time, uh, Sandy, you referred to the, the Tombstone era, and Michael, you, you talked about it a little bit too. How formative, how, in, in what way was that formative in uh, Kearns's kind of upbringing. What 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 lessons, if any, did that do you think that he might have gleaned from his time there that might have been instructive to how he went about his life when he came to Park City? Keep away from guns. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Sandy, you know this as well as I do. I mean, he uh, he really uh, learned a lot about mining law. That was a key thing with all the lawsuits that Kearns was involved in, 
the mining law and engineering and such. He, he had to have learned a lot uh, from all this, certainly a lot more than his formative years learning farming and livestock. But uh, I think that was an incredible learning curve. Uh, uh, people respected him for his mining knowledge in Got it. mining law. Sandy, could you talk a little bit of, about, you, you touched on it, the Black Jack Murphy situation and what actually, what happened there. And that was kind of a, I know there's a lot of the sidecar uh, events that you couldn't get to, but um, uh, you know, what, what, what went on there? Well, Phil, uh, the, the Matt Brennan murder uh, by Black Jack Murphy uh, basically, uh, you know, set up a situation where the town lynched Murphy uh, and then kept it a secret. And so that's, that's a pretty fascinating story. That's, uh, that's if you will, it's kind of one of my next projects. I'm, I'm looking closely at, uh, at who are the people here in the town at that time? Uh, you know, who, I mean, you know, town kept it a secret, right? So uh, there were, you know, perhaps somewhere between 30 and 75 people that were involved on the lynching end of things. Uh, that's not an easy secret to keep in a town of 3,000. Uh, it must have been carefully orchestrated, is, is the way the newspapers report it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun, although, you know, at, you know, there was a grand jury that was run at the time. They, did, they found no cause of action. They couldn't, they couldn't find out who was culpable in, uh, you know, in the lynching. And so, you know, they basically acquitted the town, if you will. Uh, but clearly, everybody that was involved was still here. And the question is just, you know, how did they bring it off and how did they keep it a secret? So that's a tale for another time, I'd say. Of note, uh, Moss was rushed out of town. Probably they were afraid the th same thing may have happened to him. Or, you know, uh, friends of Langton might have tried to lynch him or something. So he was rushed out of town. S Sandy and I talked a lot about this. You won't find much information in the park record. For some reason, Moss didn't want to speak to Radden. Uh, he only spoke to the uh, Salt Lake papers about the incident. Um, we have uh, one more question here. If anyone, uh, anyone else has a question, please uh, ask it because we're going to close soon. Um, the question for the two of you, um, as docents, we're, we tell our audience that Tom was penniless when he arrived in Park City and was a millionaire 10 years later. Is that true? Well, that's, that's the lore is that he walked into Park City with 10 cents in his pocket and he wrote out a millionaire. And he probably didn't have any money because he had to uh, he, uh, hop a freight. Uh, at that time, no train went from Park City to the Salt Lake City or vice versa, of course. But it, you had to go up to Ogden and it came back around to Colville and then um, you came in there. So he probably didn't have any money if he had to hop a freight. And uh, Yeah, the, the math on that is definitely correct, right? He shows up in town in, in 1883. And by September of 1890, you know, ore has been struck and he's forming the, uh, the relationship, you know, that, that becomes the Silver King mine. So um, and that, that's when he got a job with Tommy Williams. Pretty quick horizon. And six of those years he spent working in the Ontario, right? So really the, the riches period happened very quickly from 89 to... Yeah, to, just when right place, off. right time. And, but he knew, he knew what he was looking at when he looked underground, when he was building that tunnel for the wood, uh, the wood site. He knew that vein was going to the uh, uh, Mayflower. And that's how all those people got involved. John Judge was actually dying of silicosis at the time. So either John or Mary got, got Ivers and Emery and Rice to work his stake, basically. Um, and by the way, Josh, uh, uh, Jenny Judge ended up moving to Reno, and she died in San Francisco uh, uh, for tax purposes, I'm sure. So, so one, one more question. How did uh, he get the money to buy the mine in the first place? Uh, you know, how did he, was it, how was he able to parlay this so quickly? So I'll, I'll take a crack, and Michael, you, you may want to correct me. Uh, my, my understanding is that, uh, that uh, the, the initial financial transaction really surrounded the licensing of those Mayflower properties. And that's when he formed the Mayflower group with, uh, with four other partners. Uh, the the buy-in at that point in time was $8,000. Uh, 
Uh, so each of the partners put up 8,000. And here's where I hear two different stories. And Michael, maybe you can clear it up. Uh, one story is that uh, Tom basically got his one-fifth share by being the mover and shaker, by being the guy that pulled the deal together. It was a working stake. What's that? It was a working stake. He, well, venture and, capitalists would call sweat equity. Well, and that's <laughs> it. I mean, if you look at those mines, it is very much like venture capital because it wasn't one mine, the Silver King. You know, the Silver King had, uh, uh, had a when they finally reincorporated in 1908, uh, there were a lot of mines that came together for that Silver King Consolidated. And uh, so, you know, there's even a, a, a theory that Keith borrowed his money from RC Chambers. That's why things were kind of slippery there during the Susan, Susan Emery's lawsuit with RC Cham Chambers uh, where, uh, Chambers was trying to get a big stake in the uh, Silver King. Uh, very, that's uh, uh, Kathleen Whitley uh, did a wonderful book on that called The Silver Queen. She did a, a great research on that. So uh, that's what it was for Kearns. It was a working stake. You know, he was Mr. Outside to Keith's Inside. Keith was highly respected. Uh, Sandy brings this up uh, uh, every once in a while that Kearns and Keith were not peers, H peers. They were about 15 years apart. But Kearns was about that or more with all the partners in there. And I think he had the energy. He was willing to go, come on, let's go do this. Let's, uh, and Keith probably reined him in a bit. And uh, maybe that's what made such a great partnership over three decades. I mean, wow. how many partnerships do you know of that lasted that long? That's fantastic. Well, well guys, we, we've kind of run, run past our, our deadline here. I want to thank the two of you. Uh, well, actually, I think we have one more coming in here. Uh, uh, one more uh, comment. In uh, case anyone's interested, the Silver King Mining Company had incorporated in 1892 from several claims around Woodside Gulch, the original Mayflower, the Woodside, the Northland, the Tenderfoot and the Silver King. Yes. So, um, well, thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, and thank you guys, Sandy and, and, and Michael. This is fantastic. And really, you know, there's probably 5,000 more questions I know I have, and I suspect everyone else does as well. Maybe you, uh, in closing, Sandy, you can tell us a little bit about where to, we can get more information and uh, if people have follow-up questions and things like that. As we, as we go. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm uh, I'm more than happy to to, to talk with folks about this. Um, here's my email address and my telephone number if you want to reach out with uh, with questions. Uh, we are going to uh, post a recording of the uh, of this webinar uh, on the uh, Park City Museum website, uh, so you can access that uh, in the future. And then uh, also. Uh, Michael has actually a film under development about his uh, great grandpa. Uh, he's, he's let me see kind of an early cut of it, and he's agreed to provide to us a link to the trailer for that film. Uh, so that'd be like a little appetizer for uh, for folks that are that are interested to learn more about Tom Kern. And Sandy, thanks for bringing me in on this. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I think it uh, added a lot of value. Thanks to everybody for. Uh, for attending our webinar on such a beautiful sunny day, and uh, um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll 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 release you to uh, to your cocktails. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye bye. Diane, are you still with us? Uh, Sandy, regarding that phone call tomorrow? Yes. Um, are we, do we have to call in? Do they call? Yeah, us? there's in the email, there's a pair of numbers. There's one for you to dial and one for me. Oh, okay.